thank you, cancer, for all you have taught me. You forced my mind to grow. When I first started going to Unity in 1984, the ministers in the Clearwater Church that I attended the first time were talking about a God that I always knew existed, but that I had never heard about from any other dogma. It was the God of love, the love within all of us, the one that we are all part of, and they were what I called blasphemous at the same time, daring to say that I was God. But that felt more right than anything I'd ever heard. If God was not some man in a white beard sitting on a hill somewhere, but was everywhere present, how could I be anything less than that myself? So I started purposefully seeking a relationship with that, whatever that was. I had no clue. But I learned through vocalization, through being connected with my core physically, that my intuition was getting stronger as I was singing more and teaching more how to use those core muscles. And it was interesting to learn that the intuition is from the same part of the body that the fear is stored in. My sister and I just started last week, in fact, every morning going through a rampage of appreciation <laughs> together, every single morning. What are you rampaging about this morning, she'd say. For me, especially gratitude is incredibly essential, not just important, it's essential. To be able to stay in the present, to be able to embrace the future, to be able to embrace whatever's going on in my body, even if it's nasty and I'm in pain, how to be grateful for that. My father was a, a Eckhart Tolle devotee. And for years, he would tell me to stay in the now moment, don't go in the future, don't worry about the past, stay in the now moment. And I would say, but daddy, what happens if the now moment sucks? Isn't there an opportunity to go someplace else to buy locate? <laughs> and he'd say, no, there's always something to be grateful for. So he kind of drummed that into my head for a long time, and I practiced that consciously. So when I was first going through surgery, on my way home from my tour in Florida, where I was first diagnosed, I had two weeks to drive home. And had I known how dire my situation was at the time, I didn't look at the numbers. I didn't research what ovarian cancer did. I knew better. I was told not to. I told my mother not to. She memorized the Merck manual, so for her that was huge. On my way home, had I known how dire it was, I might have driven off a bridge. But watching myself, like my father were, reminded me to do, and to stay in the now moment, and to find things to be grateful for helped me spend the rest of the tour like I needed to and get home and in surgery. And I never needed gratitude more than I did in chemo because the bag marked poison going into my body had to be shifted somehow. And how better to shift it than going from fear to gratitude. Now, how can I be grateful to a chemical marked poison that they say would kill you as soon as it's going to cure you? I mean, the internet's not good for that kind of stuff. <laughs> but gratitude shifts everything. I am not certain that I can find a way to be grateful for these life situations that I clearly do not want. Who can really do this? This doesn't seem normal to me. Why would anyone actually choose this as a personal practice? Because one's actual personal practice is everything. It is the reason to get up in the morning, to once again practice one's most fundamental relationships, especially if one chooses to live a life in friendship with reality. If we just go through life responding to external circumstances, deciding what we like and don't like, we are always lost. It is not until we evolve a personal practice that a deep life journey in partnership with reality can begin. What do you mean? This sounds serious. 
As the saying goes, life is not a dress rehearsal. However, practice is the activity of choosing relationships that allow me to live the life to which I am committed, the life I have chosen, to act out promises or vows I make to myself, to others, and before ultimate reality in the real everyday life I live. Because this is a practice, it is, like in a sport or game, both serious and not serious. I think you are losing me. Allow Father Keating to clarify. What do you do when you have everything? In other words, God, as in his essence, doesn't need anything, doesn't have to create. What is he going to do? <laughs> well, what would you do? Maybe you might play games. <laughs> but we might ask uh, the question, well, is this uh, journey of life and uh, this evolutionary process that we are uh, immersed in, is it, is it always so serious a situation? <laughs> in other words, it, it, maybe we take it too seriously. And, and it is serious, heavens, uh, being created out of nothing is, uh, I don't know what you do with that without some <laughs> kind of guidance or help. Or, but it, it seems that God has uh, created everything with a certain uh, tenderness and, and humor. And, uh, and, and playfulness. Well, this raises the question, what games does he play? So uh, let's take a look at some of the games. That <laughs> Certainly, hide and seek is a favorite game. That is to say, God hides and we keep seeking. And once in a while, he, 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 he pokes us out uh, or tosses out some sign of, of his presence. You don't get the whole of God, I guess, because that would complete the game. <laughs> That's the end game, is, 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 is permanent union. He knows us through and through and uh, all the obstacles to our uh, spiritual progress and all the conditions that have limited our partial freedom, at least, to make a, a choice that is really uh, our own in circumstances. And, and this, is the, this enables God to uh, lead us ever so gently. It's not just a game. <laughs> it's a game plan, mm -hmm. but it does give uh, God a chance to uh, reveal his, his willingness to risk and his, uh, perhaps his love of adventure and his, uh, his desire to further the evolutionary process, but not too fast. Because nature is very slow moving, so it has to take that into account. But uh, sometimes I agree that uh, the, uh, you can't figure out what the purpose of the game is. You just have to play, hope for the best. And you can't expect to know what the, uh, what the result is or uh, whether you're winning or losing. Because sometimes you've, one feels that you, you've lost everything or you just can't handle this particular mm -hmm. game. And it doesn't seem like a game anymore, but a terrible chore and so on. But the goodness of God and the, it is never questionable. Perhaps some games are designed to see how far we will go. Uh, in other words, when are you going to blow the whistle or when are you going to call for a time out? <laughs> and meanwhile, God is seeing whether we want to play and, and if we're too uh, stuffy or staid or so on, well, he, 
he chooses games that are uh, more in line with our taste, otherwise we wouldn't play. But suppose we're willing to be, as St. Therese said, uh, be like a little ball that he can play with or throw or throw in a corner, in other words. So she has this insight into God as a, as a game player and also what a good reaction would be to those invited to participate. She likes to, how does she put it, uh, capture God with little sacrifices. And so a game would be fit that category. And so she said she sometimes thinks of herself as a, as a little ball in the hands of Jesus that he can bounce or throw in a corner or put on the shelf or throw in the air and play. He can do whatever he wants. So it's an image of, of complete uh, accord or collaboration with whatever the game might turn out to be. It's, it's this uh, marvelous psychological and spiritual but realistic kind of interaction that, that r relationship, when we look at it in the full possibilities of this concept, implies that we can relate to God in this intimate, close uh, partnership, uh, while at the same time confiding and depending and trusting God in, in, in everything we do. While living in this world, God can only share or spoon feed us or even use an eye, a kind of eyedropper to give us just a little bit of God because if, if he presented himself in as he is, especially in his essence, we would just disappear into a grease spot. It would be too much, too bright a light that we, we would be uh, blinded by it. And even when he does, in states of purification, turn up the lights, uh, they're so bright that the soul experiences darkness and absence rather than the presence. So let's take a look and see what, what God is doing now. Hide and seek is, is a favorite game, but he, he's got a lot of others. Another is let's pretend. Let's pretend uh, means <laughs> how, how let's pretend that God is close or let's pretend that God is far away or Let's pretend that God is our, uh, is in some relationship with us, which is still a projection of our imagination. Another game is uh, is let's do it again. <laughs> in other words, think of all the processes that God does over and over. No, you'd think he'd get bored. I feel like I'm ready to play. Please join me on the playground of practice. <laughs>